Hi there, everyone. Uh, thank you for sticking around. I know it was a long day. Um, it's definitely a lot more intimidating once you're here, so bear with me. Uh, my name is Tiago. I work for a small company called Recorsec. Um, in the context of this summit, I thought it was relevant to add that I also work in uh, MIS Cloud, which basically maintains um, AMIs, which are basically uh, configured images that you can spawn on AWS EC2 instances. Um, Okay. And, okay. And um, the things that we're going to talk about, even though it's in the title of the uh, of the presentation, it's not really about AWS, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about that later on. Uh, the idea here is to present scenarios for high availability for misdeployments deployments, and uh, also showcase some experiments that worked and those that failed, and some notes for deployment as well. So we're not going to be talking about step-by-step -step guides for deployment, so this is not like uh, a list that will guide you through the deployment of this, nor is it an installation for MISP. It's also not a course on AWS, um, and this is by any means not the best or the standard on how you should do high availability. The idea here is to have a conversation or start a conversation about what to do. Um, the reason that I'm doing this talk is, well, it's not just because of this issue, in the GitHub repo, but um, there was definitely some some discussion about how to do high availability in MISP, and uh, well, I thought about doing that, and the idea here is that this might be useful for someone who is trying to do a high availability deployment, um, and maybe a public reference, so people who did this before or people who want to do this maybe can give some ideas or open some issues on what they find, um, and yeah. That's how Hamispa was born, and this is basically a cluster in a high availability, resilient environment that leverages AWS. So even though I am using AWS, what we're going to talk about here today can apply to any other cloud provider, or even not even a cloud provider. If you just want to do these things all by yourself, you can do that, no problem whatsoever. So the way that we went about this is to have uh, high availability and disaster recovery for databases. All our MISP code, uh, code base is going to run on a cluster. Uh, we'll have a shared file system between all of these cluster nodes. We'll do load balancing between these cluster nodes. And the uh, interesting thing is that we want to do auto-scaling for this as well. So if something bad happens, we want to auto-scale. So we always maintain availability and performance. And we'll use as much encryption as we can, both in present and at rest. And also leverage some services for uh, uh, web application firewall and DOS protection. So what we end up with is something like this. Um, the, the way that I found is probably better to explain this is by going through each service. We're not going to go into a lot of detail, but we'll run through some of these services real quick, and we're going to do this with AWS 101. So we start here with the VPC. This is basically our network, um, and we are, we are running with a, um, with a VPC with two private subnets and two public subnets on different availability zones to maintain higher availability. We also have our DHCP options well, well configured so that we don't give public routable IP addresses where we shouldn't. And we have internet gateways for the public subnet and not gateways for private subnets. So starting off here in the database layer, uh, we are using a service called AWS RDS, which is Relational Database Services. Uh, it allows you to configure, manage, and scale databases. Uh, it also does a lot of automation, so you don't have to worry about the database aspects or maintenance of the database aspect. Uh, it supports several engines, engines uh, including MySQL, which is the one that we're going to use. Uh, disaster recover via auto-updating DNS endpoints. So basically, if something bad happens to your one of your databases, it will just update the DNS for you, and your cluster will continue working. And then there's also a read replica, which I will talk more uh, later on. Um, the way that we went about the file system was through the usage of AWS CFS which is the Elastic File System. It's basically an NFS file share that you can mount on your cluster nodes, and they will all have access to this information. Um, so Amazon maintains a mount helper for most distributions. Uh, so if you're running Ubuntu, CentOS, whatever, you'll be able to mount your NFS, no problem. It's also very easy to mount via TLS, and there's no upfront requirements for provisioning. And this is the place that will hold all of our MISP code database, or code base, actually, sorry. Um, so in regards to the EC2 instances, this is the place that will hold the actual code. Um, 
These are called uh, Elastic Compute Clouds. It's a compute capacity. Think of them as virtual machines, basically. Uh, all of these are in a very friendly uh, Linux ecosystem. So if you run, a, run Ubuntu, you can run Ubuntu, CentOS, whatever. There's a lot of choices for you there. Uh, these instances will be our cluster nodes. Uh, they will be part of the auto-scaling group, so this thing that will just provision new instances as performance requires it. And they will basically hold all of the configuration. So when we install MISP, we're going to install MISP on an instance, and that includes Apache, PHP, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, after we do the first configuration on the first instance, we're going to use that as the source for the AMI, um, and then it will just launch new instances based on that AMI. Moving on to the application load balancer, this is the place that will be the entry point for the access. It will distribute traffic across multiple targets, and it will also keep an eye on the instance health, so to see if everything is okay with the instances. Um, it will also interact with our auto-scaling group, so if it needs to spawn an instance or terminate an instance, it will do all of that by itself. And it can also be a source for our content distribution network. So if you want to publish um, MISP uh, on a CDN network, um, the ALB would be the place to do that. Now, the other thing that we have right here is our EC2 Bastion host. This is basically our way of managing all of our network because all of our network is actually in private networks, uh, or most of our, of our implementation here is behind private networks. And we need, we need a way to get in and basically do this configuration, and we do this through a Bastion host. Um, so this one actually lives in a public subnet. Uh, we use SSH keys, and we basically whitelist a single IP address to get there. We use multi-factor authentication to log in, and this machine can be turned off or on as you need it. Um, two other components here in the public subnet, so um, the, window, uh, the web application firewall. Uh, this is basically an AWS service that you can basically turn in or turn on, and it will pretty much do everything by itself. If you want to have some custom rules on it, you can. But by default, it will give you like SQL injection, cross-site scripting, stuff like that. Um, the other one is AWS Shields, which basically is a managed service for denial of service protection. Um, actually, by default, AWS already gives you this service. So anything you exp every time you expose something to the internet, AWS will give you this service. It's already turned on for free. Um, but if you want to have like another level of protection, they offer like a pro um, AWS Shield Advanced. And uh, then to end the diagram of Hamispa, we have AWS Route 53, which is basically our um, DNS provider. And it's also high, high availability managed DNS provider. And one of the cool things about Route 53 is that it does uh, health checks. So it can, it can see if, for example, if I had another load balancer and it does health check and it sees that this load balancer failed, if I had a parallel infrastructure right here, it would just stop routing to this one at the DNS level. It would stop routing to this one. It would just run to a parallel infrastructure, which could or could not be connected to the same RDS instances. Um, to finish this off, uh, you notice that um, there's an icon here for KMS, uh, and KMS is enabled here, here, and here. So database, uh, NFS, share, and the virtual machines. And this is basically the AWS key management system. Uh, it allows you to create and manage keys. And uh, the cool thing about this is that it's really easy to turn on on several different AWS services because, well, integration is just there. And it uses hardware security models for, um, well, basically for validation. So how do we put all of this together? Um, so we start off by creating the VPC and prepare the firewalls. That's the security group, so we do all of that. After that, that's done, we create the EFS shares, NFS. So we create an instance in RDS. We create the operating system and mount the NFS share. We configure, we tweak it, we do anything that we want to do with it. Uh, that includes, uh, um, well, it, you can include configuration of, uh, of MISP here as well. Um, after you use this as a source, you will use this AMI as the source for new instances, and I will show you that in a little bit. Uh, when you configure MISP, um, you will configure MISP in the NFS mount, so it would not be in the single instance. It will be in the instance, but it's actually mounted on an NFS share. Um, and when you connect, when you do the, the, the MySQL configuration of MISP, you're actually going to do that for the RDS, so you connect it uh, to RDS. And then you create the auto-scaling group, which I will show also in a little bit. You configure your application load balancer. You configure the health checks. Um, one of the tips for this is that if you are running MISP behind a load balancer, if you want to do health checks, uh, don't do health check against like users slash login because that's too heavy. Have like an HTML file, static HTML file, just to return an OK, and do the health check against that. 
So uh, after you do that, you configure the DNS. You basically can use um, ASM from AWS as well to issue the certif certificate, and that will provision and install the certificate, so you don't have to worry about maintaining any certificates, and I will talk about the actual certificates in MISP uh, in a little bit. Uh, and if you want to enable a uh, web application firewall, or if you want to publish it uh, on a, well, a CDN, so a content distribution network, you can, uh, you can do that as well. Now, um, this is... I mean, all of this is basically an installation that you can do on a single machine and you can do on separate machines. It, it's really up to you. Um, the only thing that is probably a benefit of this is the resiliency and the performance that you're going to get out of this installation. Um, and one of the things I thought would be cool to show is, um, so you can, there's actually, so this is actually running behind the website. So if you want to go to a specific website and see this, you can, but you're, you'll have no login, so you'll basically see like, see like users and user slash login. So it's not very useful. So what I thought I would do is instead of doing that or instead of like refreshing a web page and you saw, and you would be able to see like the page loading up, I thought about creating some chaos around, uh, MISP infrastructure. And, oh, sorry. And the first, um, the first test that we're going to do is basically Apache would fail, right? So you have your instance, um, and for some reason, Apache fails. And by Apache failure, I mean that the, the file that we are using to do the health check, it would not respond. So it, we would get like a timeout or something. So the application load balancer would not be able to retrieve the file that we are using to do the, uh, to do the health check. And once that, this happens, um, our application load balancer will say, okay, so this particular instance, the one that I don't get a reply from, this instance, I'm going to consider this instance faulty and I'm going to start a new one, put this one behind the load balancer balancer and terminate this one because clearly something is happening here. And that's the approach that we're taking. So ephemeral almost instances. So instances, they lose their importance because they're just instances that spawn. And the important part is actually an NFS share. So any instance is like, you can just throw it away if something bad happens to it. And uh, this is what this video will show, I think. Okay, here we go. I'm not, by the way, I'm not brave enough to do demos live. So I'm sorry for that. So there's records uh, or recordings for everything. So I will, I will talk through this. So basically we have our load balancer here. And you see that our load balancer has uh, two targets, which are now considered healthy. And this is basically because they are passing the health checks that we have configured for them. And the, um, the thing that I'm going to do after this is I'm going to go to the instances listing and I'm going to get the private IPs. And you'll see that these are non-rattable IP addresses because none of, the, none of these instances are actually exposed to the internet. And that how, as you could saw in, or as you can see in the, uh, diagram there. So I'm basically in my bastion host right there and I'm connecting to my private instances, which my security group rules allow, obviously. So I have connection from my public subnet to my uh, private subnet. And I'm basically going to, uh, stop Apache here. Okay. Um, so stop the Pashi. Everything is still okay. Uh, after the time that you define and the health checks can be configured to whatever time you want. Um, after a little bit, it will be considered unhealthy. So this means that the registered instance has a problem. So if I go to my instances, well, immediately nothing will happen because there's still some time. But if I, if I go back to my load balancer, you can see here that it's actually draining connections. So the load balancer knows that there's a problem with that instance and it will terminate the connections that are going through or going to that instance. Um, and just find a better way to route the client to the, um, well, to the working instances. And as soon as that happens, you see that a new instance is created. This actually is the, is an instance that holds the same configuration, same code, same everything. Um, and once this instance is started, if you go back to the load balancer, still nothing there, but after a while, you see here initial. So it's been registered in the load balancer. So now the load balancer knows that there's a new instance there. Until its status is healthy, nothing will happen. So the load balancer started an instance here. And this, after this moves from unhealthy to healthy or changes from unhealthy to healthy, it will say, okay, this health, this instance is good. This will be the one that we're going to be sending the traffic to now. Um, every time that this happens, you can or not, it's up to you, uh, get a notification of a new instance that was launched. You see that the faulty instance was removed, and just like that, it disappeared, it was terminated, uh, and it's no longer part of the, uh, it's no longer part of the load balancer, and you also get a notification saying that the instance was terminated. 
Okay, um, that was one example. Uh, we have another one for CPU. It's, this one is is similar, so it, it's not a very long video. But basically, what's going to happen is I'm going to stress out my CPUs just to I don't know show performance degradation or performance problems. Um, and I, I sped up the video a little bit just so you don't have to endure through this. But I'm basically doing the same thing. So I'm going to the two nodes and I'm basically putting their CPU at 100%. And I will show you why uh, the application load balancer will consider this a problem. But basically what I'm doing is I'm stressing the CPUs and I'm putting them at uh, 100%. Okay, so this is actually interesting. So it sees here, uh, you can see here that the average CPU should be at 50%. So this is a scaling policy. So I told my application load balancer, which is aware of the status of my instances, that if something happens in which my, my overall Pi doesn't have 50% of performance, it should consider that a problem and it should scale and add additional instances. And because both of them were at 100% CPU utilization, they can see the application load balancer considered them both faulty and it started actually two different instances. So you see here that it launched two new EC2 instances and it will basically do the exact same process again. So because the CPU was stressing out, it started two new instances, the old ones will be terminated, the new ones will be registered in the application load balancer. And um, well, in this case, because we only had two instances and you obviously have to, have to do some sizing when you're doing this, um, because we only have two instances and I stressed out both of them, we are obviously going to have some downtime or at least have a performance hit. Um, but you probably didn't have to be um, as aggressive as this. Uh, and this one is uh, just a termination. So if someone for some reason uh, happened to just go to the panel, delete a virtual machine, because we said that we need at least two instances for this to perform correctly, um, AWS will just start a new instance to maintain that same level of service. So if I do a terminate here, um, after a little bit, you see that it's shutting down the, uh, it's shutting down the nodes. And I see here desired to, so I always have to have two instances. And because I terminated one, it immediately started a new instance. And yeah, and the rest of the video, it's basically what you already saw. So you'll get an email saying that an instance was terminated, a new instance was added, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so going forward with this, uh, I think there's some room for improvement here. Uh, I am having some issues with Apache. I'm not exactly sure what. So maybe consider Nginx, I don't know. Um, one of the things that would also be interesting, and that obviously depends very much on your use case of MISP, um, is have, for example, an auto-scaling group for the read replicas. So um, I don't think I have, a, you know, it's... So if you go back here, here, so for example, um, this part of the database is actually for disaster recovery. So when you spawn an RDS instance, it will create your main database and it will create a second database. Um, and this is the, the, the one that in case something happens to this one, it will self-update the DNS entry so that your configuration will go to the one that is working. The read replica, however, is not for disaster recovery. So the idea that I had is if you have some systems that are using MISP in a programmatic way, let's say, for example, that you're extracting uh, information out of MISP to put on your Suricata or Snort, you're basically doing the IDS export or the NIDS export, maybe you could have an auto-scaling group or just consult this read replica directly directly, and you would get all of this information from the read replica because you don't have to interact with it. You're just basically exporting information out of MISP. You would do that through here and you would leave your normal database for your everyday use. That's just an idea. It's really, uh, it can do many different ways. So the other thing is um, I'm going to look into using AWS Elastic Cache, uh, Redis in this specific case, um, to see if we can gain some performance benefits out of this. I didn't do a lot of metrics with this. Uh, my, my, my main focus, also because the metrics are very much dependent on the instances that you are using, and I was using mostly uh, very low level or not expensive instances. Um, so I don't have a lot of performance metrics. Um, and the other thing that I want to do is basically do the DNS failover for a different application load balancer. So if Route 53, the DNS, the part that we use to access MISP, if it does the health check and if it sees that load balancer is uh, not responding, it will just route us through a different application load balancer. Um, now, 
this is not a very technical talk. I am aware of that. Um, so I, I, I will put, it's not up there yet, but I will put all of this like, uh, etc, fs tab configurations, Apache configurations. So everything that went into this, I will put up in this GitHub repo, uh, in case you're considering doing this. And yeah, like I said, if you, if you have any questions or if, the idea behind this, I know I said it's not about AWS and I then gave a lot of examples about AWS, but the idea here is to talk more about a high performance or high, not high performance like in the talk that we saw before. That's, that's, I, I, I can't do that even if I wanted. Um, but from an infrastructure perspective, perspective, an architecture perspective, um, to get the conversation started on, on high availability. So if you have any questions, yeah, feel free. I'm also on Twitter if you want to talk more about this or AWS. Yeah, Andres. Yeah. So, so first of all, thanks because this is really great stuff that you presented. But uh, one thing I was wondering about is, did you ever run into a situation with MISP where you felt that we were, you kind of had to work against a tool to make this work? So was there any blocker for you that we could basically help you with? Um, not necessarily. Um, uh, MISP is not – this sometimes – so the approach that we took here is basically the approach that you would take to have any high availability application, in a specific case in AWS. There was nothing specific in MISP that was complicated. There, There's a few situations where I was getting a lot of black holes requests. Uh, and that's, this is where I, I pinged you on Gitter. Um, because I, I still need to look into that. And, and I will, now that this is here and that I will put everything up on GitHub, I will talk with you guys because there's definitely some things that we could work there. Yeah. Uh, you, you okay. Anyone have That, that's a very good question. Uh, very, very good question. No, I haven't. No, so I haven't done anything. I, I use Terraform quite a bit and CloudFormation quite a bit. Um, to an extent, um, the MISP Cloud Packet or AMIs, they're actually built with Packer. Um, and we do some automa automation around that, but we never actually done a uh, CloudFormation or Terraform deployment of MISP. Th that's pretty interesting. Um, it, it will be, I don't know, maybe quite an undertaking. Maybe with these pieces of the puzzle, it would be quite interesting to have uh, uh, like cloud formation. I will absolutely look into that. But if, if you're working on that and if you want to ping me, yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. That that's one of the things. So on top of the uh, the sinkhole, uh, the um, the sinkhole, sinkhole, black hole, black hole. Yeah. Uh, so on top of that, we I definitely look in, need to look into that as well because that is definitely an issue. Absolutely. Yeah. Do be sure I understand. So that means right now uh, you can have a slave and master. But you're going to have two masters at the same time. Okay. That makes sense. Um, for the Redis aspect, uh, you mentioned the uh, Elastic uh, Cache. Yeah. Um, is it a standard Redis protocol uh, one? Um, so actually, Elastic Cache is... Oh, so actually, Elastic Cache is uh, AWS's offer. They have they have Memcached and they have Redis. Um, so I know that you guys are using Redis. So I, I I mentioned Redis in Elastic Cache just as an alternative of moving this off of the um, of the instance to to like sort of divide the responsibility away from the instance and move it to another service to have more components into this. Um, and Elastic Cache with Redis was the one that I thought could more easily fit into what you guys already did. Yeah. 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 Exactly. That's yeah. That's that's the idea behind the future improvement is to also work a little bit on that. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So um, the only reason behind EFS um, is because you don't have to worry about rote 
or um, basically any mounting uh, problems or any mounting issues. Um, because of the mount helper that Amazon makes available, it's quite easy to mount that as an NFS share. But you can you can basically do it with anything. As long as it's something that is transversal to all of the instances, you could go with, with anything. The cool thing about EFS is that for the operating system, it will show up as a very simple file system. You can mount it anywhere you want. Um, and that can be, for example, var www. Uh, misp so that that's cool but if you want to do it with something else you can you can absolutely can do that no problem yeah any more questions okay thank you very much <laughs>